Hello again, AP Calc AB students. We're going to take a look at a single example now, example four from topic 6.3. We're going to use the idea of upper and lower Riemann sums. So essentially what we're doing is we're revisiting some ideas from a few days ago in topic 6.2. Combine these later on with the summation information that we just uh, learned and create sort of our wonderful picture of what topic 6.3 is all about, Riemann sums and summation expressions. So let's take a look at what this idea of upper and lower sums means, and we'll start with a bit of a history lesson, right? Let's go way back in time. We're going to go on a field trip to ancient Greece. Much like the ancient Greeks learned several centuries ago, we can find the areas of geometrically challenging shapes by subdividing them into familiar shapes. The more shapes we use, typically the better our approximation. So if you take a look at these two circles, I've got one of the circles divided up into six different triangles. Right? Be, be nice if I could count. Seven different triangles. <laughs> and then I've got this other circle divided up into, uh, let's just say, many more triangles. I think there are 12. If we were to only find the area of all of the triangles added together, which of those two total areas would be a better depiction for the entire region of the circle? And hopefully you're all thinking circle number two. And that's exactly right. You know, at one time, circles were very challenging shapes for the Greeks. This is long before pi was ever discovered. As soon as pi was was discovered, and the Greeks had a very approximated method for pi, taking the circumference and, and simply dividing that by the diameter, they were able to really do some very uh, intricate work with circles. Now, this has got a pretty nice connection to calculus. What, well, how is it that, you know, throwing a bunch of rectangles inside of a circle makes a big difference? Well, it's going to help us understand this idea of Riemann sums and finding upper versus lower sums. So I've got an activity here that um, you're only going to be able to do if you were able to acquire this file this Riemann sums file from me. It's very likely if you're watching this video and you're one of my students, maybe you haven't had a chance to get into school and get this file from me. Make sure that you do that the very next day that I see you. And if you're watching this video outside of Avon, I still think that you can get a lot from watching this particular uh, 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 video and seeing this activity. Uh, but I do want to tell you that this activity can be found on the TI website. If you just basically Google Texas Instruments and RiemannSums.TNS, it's very likely that you will find this particular file. If you're using a TI-84, this file unfortunately does not exist for that particular model. So what this example says is let's consider the function f of x equal negative x squared plus 5 between the values 0 and 2. We are asked to find two approximations of this area that lie beneath or between this curve, the x-axis, x equals 0, and x equal 2 using the five subintervals that are rectangles. And we're best of all, we're going to be able to use the Riemann sum file to find the approximations. We want to make sure that we can sketch these as well. So the very first thing that I'm going to do cosmetically, if you're using uh, your notes, follow along with me, is let's go ahead and denote that x is 0 right here at about the origin. And x is 2, not where you might think. I want you to put 2 at the very right endpoint. I know that seems a little crazy. Why on earth would we do that? Well, it problem says that we're going to divide this into five subintervals. So you can go ahead and uh, with a ruler or by just uh, hand drawing, you can put your vertical strips in here. So there's one, two, a third one, a fourth one, and then we actually draw this very last one as well, and there we have what will eventually become five separate shapes. Now, it says that we're going to use a right endpoint approach. So if we use a right endpoint approach, that means that each of these positions are going to be used to cap off our shape by moving to the left 
we use the right endpoint and we move to the left. And this particular set of five rectangles, if we were to shade them in, and I'm going to go ahead and do that with this lovely yellow highlighter, is going to depict the area that I want us to find. Now, if you find that your shading and so forth is kind of lagging behind mine, just pause the video, work through your notes, make that look neat, and then you can resume the video at any time. So there we have it. Let's go ahead and do the same thing and draw in what's happening for the left endpoints. Now, it turns out that you're going to be doing a lot of the same kinds of things. In other words, you're going to be partitioning this off with these various strips here. Again, going to try to draw them straight. It looks a lot better if you use a straight edge. And now we're going to cap these off using a left endpoint, which means we move from the left side to the right side to make this happen. And lo and behold, we end up having five rectangles that we're going to find the area for. And I'm going to shade these guys in orange. And I'll even try to color inside the lines as best I can. So essentially, the problem is asking us to find the area of each of these five rectangles added together. Now, it's possible to do this by hand, but I will warn you, it's a little bit tedious. And the reason that it is, is because these increments that you have along the x-axis are not very nice numbers. If you recall, the standard formula to find the width is b minus a over n. I hope that you remember that from a previous video because we're going to rely on that quite a bit coming up. And so if you take 2 minus 0 and divide by n, which is 5, it's clear that the width is 2 fifths, which means since you're starting at 0, the value here is 2 fifths. But if you continually add 2 fifths, you get 4 fifths, 6 fifths, 8 fifths, and then finally 10 fifths, which is 2. And over here, you have the exact same thing. Now, if you recall earlier in this unit, we actually would use these numbers and plug them into our function right up here to figure out what the heights were. And as I can imagine, when you plug in 2 fifths and 4 fifths for this x and square it and add 5, things are going to get a little tedious, especially if you don't have a calculator. All right. But what my kind of motivation is for this particular problem is to make sure that you understand that in the example here, we could say that the area using the right endpoint would be referred to as a lower sum. So that's what we see right here. A lower sum is coming from this picture. And the reason is because the sum of the rectangles is not quite as much as what the area would be under the curve. So we have basically a, a, um, a deficiency. And we have that deficiency due to the fact that this graph has a decreasing nature to it. We're going to talk about that more later as well. Now, if you look at the other picture with the left endpoints, we find that we have a different situation altogether. In this particular problem, we have an upper sum. In other words, we have a scenario where the area of all of these orange rectangles added together would be greater than the area under our curve. Now, I can't emphasize this next statement enough. Do not assume that right endpoints always produce a lower sum because it's going to depend on whether or not f of x increases or decreases. So you want to be kind of comfortable with that idea. In the meantime, I want to go ahead and spend just a moment and share a very cool program with you, one of my favorite programs on the TI Inspire, and it's called Riemann Sums. Again, you can acquire this from the TI website.
And if you move through uh, the pages, uh, it just mentions that you're going to be able to change and drag points on the values A, B, and N to explore. Page two kind of tells you what you're able to edit. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this page because you're going to see these various edits when you get to topic or page three, I guess. And right here is where all the magic happens. I love this activity. So what you're going to be able to do with this is you're going to be able to edit the function. And you can do that very simply by clicking on it and you can then uh, hit uh, a variety of things. I can double click. Um, I think maybe if you're using a handheld calculator might be easiest for you to perhaps hit menu, graph entry, and function. That's probably the best way and then you'll have to scroll up in order to reach that particular function line. If by some chance you're a teacher watching this video and you have the software, you can just double click with your mouse. And what we want to do is we want to type in our function for our problem, which is negative x squared plus 5. Well, hey, that looks familiar. Kind of looks like those graphs that we had, right? The next thing that you're going to be able to do is you're going to be able to drag your little open circle movable point where A is over to where we have zero. Now to do that you would just simply hover over and then you can either hit control click button or if you just hold this click button that I'm circling for about a two second count that will close the hand and then you can move accordingly. And then you're going to want to do the same. Whoops, I didn't let go. I'm sorry. Let's try that again. <laughs> Let's grab this guy. There we go. And now we're going to move him there. And then I'll let go this time. Okay, we're going to want to do the same thing for this point over here at 6. It's kind of tough to grab since it's at the edge. But grab him and you want to move him here to where B is 2. The next thing that you're going to want to do is move this slider over here in green, which is going to depict how many shapes we have. And we want three shapes, five shapes, seven shapes. Nope, five shapes would be perfect for me. One, two, three, four, five. There we have it. And it will find the area approximation for you. Right there you have it. Now that's using a left endpoint approach. So you got to be careful because I actually did the second problem here first. What if you want the right endpoint? Well, slide this cursor over to where it says right, and there you have it. And so your two values are going to be 6.48 for the right side. I'm going to return to the document and I'm going to write that down. 6.48. How about we use a pen? And then for the left side endpoint, dragging this back, we get 8.08. .08. And so I'll plop that in here. Notice that one of them is larger than the other, hence upper sum versus lower sum. And it's very likely that the exact sum is somewhere in between. How much in between? That's something that you can think about. I don't think it's going to be exactly halfway in between. A lot of kids assume that. So to finalize things, I just want to return back to this program and just kind of mention some of the other cool things that you can do. Yes, you probably figured out when you slide this to M, you see the midpoint set up. When you slide it over to T, you see the trapezoid set up. But notice, no matter what kind of an approximation you use, this exact area remains at 7.333 and that's going to become the large focus of this unit as we move much deeper into it and understand how to find these exact areas. Hope this helps you understand upper sums and lower sums a little bit better. We'll see you next time.